Chapter 14 I took a few more backward steps, preparing to run. You won't get far, the boy said. There's not a man or woman in sight that won't help catch you. We're all one big family here, you see. And we don't like strangers. I was... I was just passing through. Well, then you've got to pay a passing through fee. He drew his dagger. Now, what will it be? Your clothing or your ears? Neither, said a voice behind them. The large boys turned, and I took immediate advantage of the distraction. For the second time that day, I was on the run, and this time I was far from fresh. Hans reached out to stay me, but I was a confirmed master of dodging and left them with a handful of air. I expected at any moment to hear the boys thundering after me. Instead, I heard my name being called. Witch! Wait, witch! I raced on, nearly blind with panic and fatigue. How had they learned my name? Witch! The voice called again, high and clear. Wait! It's me! I slowed and half turned. The two bully boys were nowhere in sight. Instead, a slighter and far more welcome figure was chasing after me. Julian? I gasped. I stumbled over some obstacle and fell to my knees, struggling for breath. Julian reached me and held out a hand. I pushed it away. I can manage. Yes, well, you wouldn't have managed if I hadn't happened to show up just then, would you? Come. He guided me to a booth with grain sacks piled against it. Mind if we rest here a bit, Hugh? He asked the man within the booth. Anything you ask me, dear, the man said. You seem to be kenned here, I observed when my breath had caught up with me. Known, you mean? I should hope so. It's where I was born and raised. Alsatia, we call it. You grew up here? I looked at our squalid surroundings, then at Julian, whose appearance and manner spoke of better things. He shrugged. There's worse places. None that I've seen. Watch what you say, or you may never leave. Not standing up at any rate. I glanced about nervously and got to my feet. I'll leave now then, I whiz. I pointed down the street. The river's that way. I may as well go with you. It's only an hour or so until curfew anyway. But you said you lived here. No longer. Not since I began my apprenticeship three years ago. I live with Mr. Phillips and his wife now. And your parents, they don't mind? Julian gave a humorless laugh but said nothing. I looked back over my shoulder. How is it you escaped those two back there so easily? They wouldn't dare touch a hair of my head. I've got friends here that would cut their ears off, and they know it. I rubbed at my own ears instinctively. They came near to cutting mine off. I should thank you. Yes, he said. You should. Well, I said, thanks then. You're welcome. I truly was thankful, but at the same time I resented the fact that he'd had to rescue me. Ever since I'd come to London, I'd been getting into situations from which someone else had had to extract me. I was weary of feeling foolish and helpless and useless. I had failed even to make fruitful use of the one skill I did possess, the art of character. When we descended the rain-slick stairs to the water, Julian asked, do you have passage money? Nay, I said, feeling helpless yet again. He handed a wherryman two pennies and four farthings. As we pushed out into the river, he said, You can repay me when you get your wages. Y you mean, I'm to be paid? When you get through your trial period. It's only three shillings a week, but it's better than nothing. Although, come to that, I suppose I'd do it for nothing. You would? Why? Why? He repeated with a puzzlement equal to my own. If you don't know, you won't make much of a apprentice, much less a player. I won't in any case. Not with that attitude. The only ones who succeed are the ones who want it so badly that nothing will keep them from it. That was hard for me to imagine. I had never bothered to want anything that badly, for I knew it was no use. 
In the past few days, I had gotten glimpses of a world very different from the one I was used to. A world I might have wished to be a part of, but knew I never could. What was the good in longing for something you could not have? Life was full enough of disappointments without making more. Once on the South Bank, Julian said, You can find your way to Mr. Pope's from here. I'm not wholly helpless, I said indignantly. I'm glad to hear that. At Mr. Pope's house, everyone was seated at supper. Mr. Pope lifted his shaggy eyebrows in surprise as I entered. Well, I supposed we had seen the last of you. Why? You wouldn't be the first Prentice who's run off. Sander said you'd found your first day not quite to your liking. That may be, but I'm not one to quit. He nodded and smiled slightly. Good, good. Perhaps you'd best change before you come to the table. You look like a drowned cat. As I climbed the stairs to our room, Sander came up behind me. Why did you run off like that? Is something wrong? Nay, I said, it's not. You can tell me which. I can keep a secret. For a fleeting moment, I was tempted to open up to him. But how could I? If I did, I would be burning both my bridges. I could never finish my mission for Simon Bass, but neither could I go on being apprentice once they had learned the truth about me. I shook my head. It's not. He sighed. I can't be your friend if you won't talk to me. I never asked you to be my friend. I never asked for anything. The moment I spoke the words, I regretted them, but I could hardly take them back. Besides, they carried a certain truth. I didn't want him or any of the players to be my friend, for I would only have to betray them. And yet, some part of me wondered how it would be to have a friend, and to be one. Blinking, Sander backed away down the stairs. Very well, he said in a hurt voice. I was only trying to help. I spent as much time as I reasonably could drying off and donning my old clothing, which had been washed without my knowing. When I came downstairs, everyone had left the dining room except Mistress Willingson, who cheerfully set before me a plate of food she had kept warm on the back of the stove. My day of rest had proved far from restful, nor did I get much rest that night. Each time I fell asleep, I dreamed of a hooded figure pursuing me and woke in a sweat. As we started for the globe in the morning, I was heartened to see that for a change the sky was clear. But my small delight vanished when we arrived to find that our morning's task was to whitewash the roof thatch. Gog's bread, I grumbled as we climbed the ladder. Why does the thatch have to be made white? Sander laughed. It's to keep it from catching fire again. Would that it had burned to the ground, I muttered. Sander pulled up the bucket of whitewash. What's that? I said, would that we could do this from the ground. I stuck my long-handled brush in the bucket and made a few grudging passes at the thatch, then paused and looked out over the plain of red-tiled roofs below me. Why did they not make this one of tile? Too much of an expense. Aye, and it won't cost them a thing if we break our necks. As I made another careless swipe at the rough reeds, I spotted on the road below a cloaked figure that I momentarily took to be Falconer. So startled was I that I lost my hold on the brush. It skittered across the thatch and plummeted to the yard three stories below. Oh, holy mother! What's wrong now? I've lost my brush. I stared gloomily after it. Half the yard was eclipsed from my view. Into the half I could see stepped a man with a large white splotch on one shoulder of his dark brown doublet. Who is that up there? the man called. It's Witch, I replied, in a voice as high and unsteady as my perch. Who? Witch, the new boy. Well, we don't need the yard whitewashed, Widge, nor the players. I, sir. I turned to Sander, who was holding a hand over his mouth to stifle his laughter. It's not funny. It struck someone. Who was it? 
Not Mr. Burbage, I hope. I don't ken. A white with long dark hair, pointy beard. Sunder bit his lip and raised his eyebrows. Mr. Shakespeare. Oh, Giss. Will a hammy dismissed you, Wiz? Not very like. He's a bit prickly at times, but not mean-spirited. Best go fetch your brush. Before I climbed down, I took another look toward the road. Falconer, if indeed it had been he, was not in sight. We whitewashed no more than the fourth part of the roof, before the church bells rang terse, the hour for our lessons to begin. There were fencing exercises, made slightly more tolerable by the fact that Nick was gone. No one seemed to know where or why. After fencing, one of the hired men, a former apothecary's apprentice named Richard, instructed us in the art of painting our faces. As I sat before the looking glass, brushing cochineal on my cheeks, a gypsyish-looking man with a high forehead and a mane of curly black hair came up behind me. A likely-looking lot of lissom ladies, eh, Mr. Shakespeare? Very fetching. Mr. Shakespeare glanced down at me. Have a care now. You don't want that brush to escape you. I flushed with embarrassment. There, you see, you've reddened your whole face. I'm sorry about the whitewash, I murmured. It will wash, he said. A pity it did not fall a bit to the left. You'd have saved me the trouble of whiting my face for today's performance. His words puzzled me until I recalled his role as the ghost. So, Hamlet was scheduled for this very afternoon, and here was I with no table book in which to set it down. That was meant to be a jest, Mr. Shakespeare said. Sorry, he shook his head. Thank heaven my audience is not made up of such sober sides. Sander, see that this lad is given instructions in laughing. Sander grinned. Yes, sir. When Mr. Shakespeare had gone, Richard looked us over critically. Very good, Julian. Sander, too much black about the eyes. You look as though you're consumptive. Widge, a little less whitewash next time and smooth it out under your chin. Clean up now. It's nearly dinner time. As we wiped our faces, he said, It's sunny today, so wear a hat outside. Else we'll be having to put a pound of white on to hide the freckles. Remember, it's easier to tan a hide than to hide a tan. Sander elbowed me in the ribs. Laugh, he said. As it happened, Sander would have done well to leave his face made up. When the time came for the performance, Nick failed to appear. Mr. Hemmings came back and took the book from Sander's hands. C -c -c Go and g get yourself up in Nick's costume. D -d -d Do you know his lines? I've a nodding acquaintance with them, Sander said, his voice sounding uncharacteristically nervous. Have the p -p -p property master give you his side and read from it if you m must. Yes, sir. Sander hurried off. Mr. Hemmings looked after him, rubbing his forehead as though it pained him. Then he glanced over at me and, to my astonishment, thrust the book into my hands. Which, you'll hold the b -b -b book. If anyone seems lost for a line, feed them a few words. Not a whole mouthful, mind you, just a taste to start their jawbones m -m 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 moving. Can you do that? I closed my gaping mouth and said, I and he strode off to deal with some other crisis. For a moment, all I could do was stare at the book in disbelief. All the fretting and scheming I'd done over how I would copy the play, and suddenly, here it was, handed over to me in one piece, without the slightest effort on my part. All I had to do was took it under my arm and turn and walk out of the theatre.